Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Pasord and I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in private practice in Harley Street, London. And welcome to this podcast for the Royal College of Psychiatrists. I'm delighted to be joined now by David Humbert, who has written a fascinating new book, the title of which is Violence in the Films of Alfred Hitchcock, A Study in Mimesis. And this book is published by Michigan State University Press. So David Humbert is an associate professor and chair of the development of religious studies at Thornalow College, Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario. So welcome, David. And you've written a fascinating book here. The first question I have to ask, which is why Alfred Hitchcock? You've devoted an in-depth uh, psychological, psychoanalytic analysis of his movies in this book. Why did you pick this particular director? I think Alfred Hitchcock is is special among directors. I think that's uh, probably something everyone would say, but he's special because he has several recurrent themes, I think, that really lend themselves to psychoanalytic interpretation, but also to the interpretation which I take, which is uh, from the uh, standpoint of mimetic desire. Um, so he just has a constellation of themes which he follows all the way through his work. Uh, back to, he, 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 some of your listeners may not know, in fact, he produced films back in the 20s and right on up until the 1970s. So uh, he had a very long career and had a very um, central role in the, in the crafting of the story of his films. So he was always involved in the script and always shaped its themes and its uh, and its uh, content. So he just is a particularly unique uh, director among directors uh, that uh, lends itself. Really, you know, his work lends itself to the kind of analysis I want to do. Is it also fair to say um, that when one watches a Hitchcock film, one just gets a sense there's more going on than simply what's on camera, that everything's been thought through carefully and it's multi-layered, um, whereas in many perhaps modern films that we watch today, kind of what you see is what you get. It's a very simple, straightforward story. But you get a sense with Hitchcock that you've got to pay attention and maybe you've got to watch the film more than once um, because there's kind of depth in there. I, I don't know what your thoughts are about that. Well, I, I agree entirely. I mean, uh, I think uh, Hitchcock's uh, films lend themselves to multiple viewings. Uh, there's, of course, a reason why you have that impression that the films are so carefully crafted is that uh, he himself uh, was involved in the crafting of the film, of each film he did. He practically... Uh, uh, designed each shot for for the film. In fact, he had a, a for every film a set of storyboards, which in detail kind of uh, showed what kind of shots he wanted and this kind of thing. And he was very much involved in the crafting of the story as it's related to those sort of visual images that you get in the film. So, um, and he was actually reported to have. Uh, uh, by some many different actors and writers to have actually stored the entire film in his head before he started shooting. And he would, on occasion, simply tell them in detail how the camera would move, uh, what unfolded in particular scene entirely from memory. So he really was, uh, I think, uh, uniquely obsessive in the design of his films before he actually started shooting. That isn't always the case with all directors. They don't always work that way. And I also get a sense that Hitchcock, and obviously you're much more of an expert on him than I am, was kind of interested in getting inside the viewer's head. He was exploring stuff that's going on inside us on yes. film, and that is part of the appeal of his films. Well, I think so. I think it's the kind of psychological depth that you see in the, in the films. Um, he's very... Uh, sort of fascinated by the, the the dimensions of human behavior going right down into the inward self, you might say. Um, and he wasn't just simply concerned with externals, but he was, an, you know, very much concerned with the interior of a character and how they related to the world outside. Um, sometimes his films can have the give the impression of, of simplicity. I, I think, especially the birds, which we'll probably talk about. Uh, is especially that kind of film, but 
even then there are there is the suggestion of layers and layers beneath the characters that are expressed in both visually and in, in dialogue and uh, he's really simply a master at uh, designing a film uh, with uh, multiple layers of meaning as you call it but is it also fair to say he's quite good at getting into our anxieties as ordinary human beings stuff that makes us anxious stuff that makes us ashamed stuff that makes us feel guilty uh, these strong emotions yes. he's probing them um which is why they have a gripping but disturbing sense his films exactly yes there is a a, a very strong dis quality of disturbance and i i often refer to him as a, as a filmmaker of anxiety essentially uh there's a great he's able to summon up dread with a uh, a single shot sometimes or 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 a certain sound which is associated with the shot you know He's, uh, or with uh, his, sometimes you'll see things like a close up on a hand that seem very disturbing, you know, because there is captured in the kind of uh, the way he cap way he photographs that hand, uh, something of the, the derangement that's going on in the character uh, to whom it belongs. So, uh, yes, he, he, he's definitely somebody who I think captures the marginal aspects of, of human nature, uh, the things we tend to look askance from or don't observe too often. I think this is also the reason why he's sometimes uh, uh, considered to be a horror director, which I don't think is entirely true. Um, I, I think that that's one thing he does. But uh, I think uh, largely, as you say, he's someone who focuses on anxieties, dreads, and guilts, and so on. These aren't necessarily pleasant um, dimensions of human nature, but they're things that fascinate us. We, we you know, it, it tells us something about ourselves. We all uh, struggle with that kind of thing as well. So, yes. So Hitchcock, before your book, has attracted um, psychoanalytical uh, interpretation, um, and in particular, maybe Freudian psychoanalytical interpretation. Um, you don't have to be a classic Freudian to think in the film Psycho, for example, yes. about uh, the main character mm -hmm. um, murdering his mother yeah. and then inhabiting, um, I don't want to spoil the film for anyone who hasn't seen it, but, but inhabiting, yes. as it yes. were, uh, the, the life of the mother um, mm -hmm. to, to see that maybe Freud himself um, was interested in Freudian theories and, and therefore um, his films have attracted a Freud analysis. But your book is saying there's other stuff going on here and you, you refer to a, a mimetic or mimesis in mm -hmm, analysis. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what you mean by mimesis and what is the difference between that and the classic Freudian or, as you also say in your book, Lacanian uh, approach? Yes. Um Freud uh, was obviously very interesting to uh, Hitchcock, and he he referred to him many times in his in his films. In fact, there's a, a film uh, uh, it's called Spellbound, in which uh, features a psychoanalyst, uh, you know, uh, treating a patient uh, uh, under her care, and uh, you know. Clearly, the kinds of uh, content in some of the films, you know, obviously this tortured relationship between a mother and son in Psycho uh, certainly is in Freudian territory. Um, the thing is that it doesn't necessarily capture the breadth of Hitchcock's uh, treatment of human nature, but also I think it assumes that necessarily, you know, because Hitchcock was influenced or had read Freud, that somehow he uh, was saying exactly the same thing. I think there's some evidence. In fact, there's some uh, scenes, for example, in, in Birds, where he, uh, one of the characters actually questions some of Freud's uh, theories, uh, as if Hitchcock is speaking through her in a way. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say that he'd learned nothing from Freud, but I think there are d scenes and um, uh, scenarios in, in Hitchcock's films that don't quite fit the pro Freudian paradigm. Um, now, mimesis is uh, a, 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 a kind of a concept which was de devised by a thinker named René Girard, who uh, was himself a, an, a you know it was a very close reader of Freud, but disagreed very deeply with the. 
uh, the structure of his ideas, but appreciated many of the insights in Freud. In fact, some of his uh, his notion of mimesis is drawn and, and given examples by some things in Freud. But his argument was that Freud didn't really understand uh, the implications of mimesis and hadn't really taken it far enough. Now, to explain what mimesis is, um, is simply that um, mimesis is the thesis that uh, uh, desire or what we desire is acquired not necessarily uh, um, uh, naturally, but is something that we acquire from without. Is It's if something we adopt by imitation. So mimesis, the word, of course, means imitation. Um, uh, it, to, to understand this, you have to think of very simple, there's some very simple examples that, uh, you know, if you think of a child and a father, for example, um, who a child will often share the desires of his father or share the likes of his father. Um, if there's a favorite sports team, for example, it's, it's very likely if you're a seven-year-old and your father is a fan of the New York Yankees, it's likely you're going to be as well because you tend to borrow your father's likes and dislikes. You, you borrow his desires in a sense. Uh, and uh, even Freud uses some examples which could be classified, uh, classified as mimetic when he talks about a, a son, for example, sitting at the father at the dinner table, but taking the father's chair and wanting to be the father. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course we are all familiar with, uh, you know, a son who wants to drive with dad in the car and this sort of thing. So, um, mimetic desire is simply a, a desire we acquire by invitation rather than something that emerges from within. Now, according to Freudian theory, um, we are driven constantly by a chaotic realm of desire, which uh, has its roots in this thing called the id, this unconscious uh, a set of drives which uh, uh, which have been kept down or 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 controlled by uh, civilizational values and uh, by our upbringing and by by moral training and that kind of thing. Uh, but essentially, desires are are, are not uh, you know the, the 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 core of desire comes from the incestuous drives which uh, uh, really inhabit us at, at the stage of the infant and. Um, go through many kinds of transformations through maturation and, and adulthood. Uh, but essential, you can't really uh, leave these desires. Um, mimet mimetic desire, in, uh, by contrast, is something which can have any object, really, as uh, a uh, object of desire, not necessarily rooted in the father and the mother alone. Um, it, it has tremendous social implications because obviously when we um, like uh, certain fashions, for example, we may be guided in those likes by the fact that our favorite stars wear them, for example. Uh, fashion itself probably spreads through a kind of nemesis because in a sense people imitate each other, they find something attractive, they want to emulate it, they... Uh, and it uh, spreads in this kind of strange way. All of a sudden, you see people wearing the same stuff. You know, how does that happen? You know, except through a process of of emulation and mimesis. So that's the basic contrast I would see between mimesis and Freudian desire. Is that Freud, mimesis is essentially open ended. It, it it can transform and find many different kinds of objects depending on the situation. But I also thought that mimesis as an idea gives people more freedom in the sense that they're choosing what they pursue. Was a Freudian idea says that we're trapped by our unconscious drives that are formed often in childhood and we're kind of victims of those things. Um, and I think there's a phrase you use in the book. You say desire is less like a Freudian guided missile and more like a leaf blown by the wind. Um, I'm going to ask you to comment on that in a second, but I just want to back that up again with another example you give that you, you the way you describe a Mises as describe it, René Girard himself is an example of an abandoned toy in a daycare center. One mm -hmm. of the children comes over and starts to play with that toy. Mm -hmm. And another child sees the first child playing with a toy and now desires the toy and yes. fights the first child for the toy. The yes. point being that earlier on, 
uh, the toy was abandoned. No one was interested in the toy. But Absolutely. interest is only generated because one kid decides they're interested, then everyone else gets interested. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is the basis of his claim that uh, desire in the true sense is triangular. That's to say we love things sometimes through the eyes of others, or others will can select things for us uh, to desire. And so in, a, in that case of the child in the, in the, in the daycare center, uh, the object itself is entirely uh, indifferent to both children until one seizes hold of it. Once that child has it in his possession, it becomes a prized object. So in a sense, you're kind of loving that toy through the eyes of that other child who's in possession of this toy. Um, so that has nothing to do, in a sense, with the um, with the with the Oedipal drives. It's it's just kind of a basic mechanism in human behavior. Uh, and I'm not sure it makes you more free. I'm not sure I would agree with that because uh, if you're a leaf blown by the wind, you're just as much subject to necessity and chance as somebody who's driven by internal drives. Um, in some respects, freedom comes from uh, resisting mimesis, as to say, or finding a counter mimesis, which uh, frees you from that thing. So if you are, uh, if you think of this child uh, becoming, both of those children becoming embroiled in a battle over a toy, which uh, previously meant very little to them, uh, you can say that they've, in a sense, become imprisoned by mimesis, uh, that they, it kind of escalates to a point where they come to blows. Uh, so this fascinated uh, René Girard because it was something that seemed to show that there's a kind of continuity between the nature of our desiring and the emergence of violence, uh, which um, it comes about as a kind of when the desires of two different people can sort of converge on the same object. And in a way, um, it, it, it uh, you know it it it, can, it, it uh, develops this um, kind of escalating struggle <laughs> over this uh, single object. Now all of this kind of thing I think is uh, uh, as I say it isn't really uh, doesn't really free you so much, but it does mean that mimetic desire is more undetermined in some sense. It's not really. Uh, determined from within. It's de determined from without. It can have many different kinds of objects. We can have many different kinds of um, desired models, for example, because for Gerard, it's the, the, the model to some extent that uh, drives our desire for something. That little boy, once he sees the the toy became the model for the other child. He wanted to be that child. He wanted to be the one in possession of that uh, toy. Um, so there's a certain way in which from the, the, the logic of, of, of mimetic desire, uh, violence can kind of emerge. And this became increasingly a subject for, uh, for, for Girard. And the reason that becomes, for me, an important thing for Hitchcock is that he seems to identify this very same kind of process uh, in his treatment of rivalry and jealousy in his films. Uh, in fact, uh, there's some really startling examples, which I try to give in the book, actually. Um, okay, but, but Gerard, uh, in, in your opening um, material in the book, um, is interested in the link between violence and religion. Could you explain yes. that? Well, uh, he was led from, once he formulated this idea of mimetic desire, he started out as a theorist of literature. In fact, he saw this as a kind of a, that there were select writers like Shakespeare or Dostoevsky who seemed to have a privileged insight into this. Uh, he, he felt that this was something that uh, perceptive uh, novelists and artists uh, were able to pick up in the human psyche. And uh, which really kind of sidestepped some of the theoretical approaches to the psyche that came to be as a result of uh, scientific endeavor. So, in fact, you can actually learn things from a novelist and how he treats uh, this kind of thing. Um, now, your original question, I'm sorry, I've just gone right past it. To, what, uh, violence what, and religion. Gerardo's violence, and religion. Religion. violence and religion, yes. right. So um, the mimetic desire he felt was such a pervasive thing in human culture, he feels, that uh, um, 
that it became more and more plausible to him that uh, religion was somehow related to it as a way of controlling violence. Now, this seems kind of paradoxical because we're, we're used to the argument that, uh, that uh, religion promotes violence, and I think in some respects it does. Uh, but he argues that uh, ha after having studied a great deal of material in anthropology and, uh, um, and uh, ritual societies and uh, primitive societies, argued that um, violence was probably an ever-present danger in human communities from the beginning, and that uh, religion kind of evolved as a way of channeling or restricting mimetic desire, which they, he feels is, again, at the core of uh, human conflict. Um, now, this is a very long and tangled argument that he makes, but uh, to put it in a nutshell, his argument is that uh, societies at some point would reach some kind of crisis uh, in which um, social order might break down. Now, when social order breaks down, there are um, a multitude of uh, conflicts that emerge because the order in society is kind of preserved when people observe differences, that there's certain things that some people have that I don't have, and the peasant respects what the rich man has, and there's a kind of a, a basic kind of order. But if a crisis emerges in a society, and even in very small primitive societies, of a plague or a famine or something of that nature, uh, this might cause a kind of uh, rapid social breakdown, and we have, you know, many historical examples of this. Um, and the tendency of people to, uh, in a sense, uh, compete with one another and uh, uh, basically fight one another is vastly increased. So in a situation of plague, obviously you have, you know, sometimes the, uh, you know, the peasants will turn on the noble and uh, brother will turn on brother, sister will fight with the sister, etc. There's a kind of a generalized social breakdown. Uh, he, he feels that uh, uh, there's an argument to say that religion to some extent uh, controls that um, uh, that impulse to to mimic others in their desires and uh, somehow preserve a kind of social order. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it, it can also exacerbate the problem. It, you know, if, uh, 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 if uh, you know, um, mimesis is, is, is actually assisted by religion, which it is sometimes, um, when you have uh, certain people scapegoated and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you so, very much for that. Okay. Did you want to say something more about that? No, no, that's good. Um, so let's just now return to Hitchcock's films themselves. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things you discuss in the beginning part of the book is that there's a central question about Hitchcock's films, unlike many other films, which is what are the films actually meant to be about? They often mm -hmm. start off making the audience believe they're going to be about one thing, and then they turn around and seem to be about something else and one of the classic words that's used to describe this plot device is called a macguffin so could you explain a little bit about what a macguffin is um and maybe we might use uh the example in the film psycho where the film appears to be at the beginning about a woman stealing some money from um uh, her employer yeah. Yeah. And it ends up being about something completely different well the macguffin is simply the you know, the object that the characters in a film are interested in, but aren't, isn't necessarily interesting to the audience. So if that, that bit of money that she steals from her employer in Psycho is a kind of MacGuffin, it's something that obviously concerns her terribly much, for, but for us as the audience, it's not really a big issue. We're more interested in the kind of... Uh, fact that she has to flee the police or that she's afraid of being caught and that she hides out in this terrifying motel, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're more interested in the personal conflicts that arise from that object more than the object itself. Um, so uh, in another kind of film, for example, a spy film, they might be after a certain kind of formula. Uh, but what we're more interested in is that the spy is having an affair with the 
uh, someone behind uh, on the other side, for example, it's the emotional conflict that's generated by the pursuit of this object that's important. So the MacGuffin is really something that matters to the characters on the screen, but doesn't matter too much to the audience. It's something that generates the suspense, the plot uh, ins and outs, but isn't really uh, uh, essential to the audience's enjoyment of the film. But I also thought that the Hitchcock films have a kind of quality whereby he is um, taking his time to tell you what the film is going to be about. And he plays mm -hmm. with that, mm -hmm. uh, which is very unlike modern films. Modern films seem very keen to get you to understand very rapidly what this film is going to be about. <clears throat> it's going to be a spy thriller. It's going to be a romantic comedy. And yeah. once they've established very rapidly, or almost in an anxious way, they want you to relax. The, yeah. That you, you're going to understand the rules of this game. It's a romantic uh -huh. comedy. Whereas uh -huh. Hitchcock is unusual, it seems to me, and I, I first got this idea from reading your book, in that uh -huh. he's saying um, you, you're going to keep guessing for quite a long period of time, maybe for the whole film, trying to figure out what this film is actually about. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that's true. I, I would say that's absolutely true. It's certainly true about Psycho because uh, when, at the beginning of the film, of course, the, it, it focuses on this uh, woman, uh, Janet Lee, who steals this money and uh, she's abruptly killed, you know, uh, uh, very sh early into the film. Again, I'm sorry if this gives away something for the audience. Uh, but, um, and, and the story continues along completely different lines. Um, but that the MacGuffin is a little bit different. It simply refers to that object in a film that is uh, of concern to the to the actors uh, in the story, but not so much a concern for the audience. Uh, um, Hitchcock gave a little story to explain what it what it uh, what it meant. He, he he said, "Imagine two gentlemen on a train in in a in a train car uh, traveling in the Scottish Highlands." Uh, there's a, an enormous bag over the head of one of these gentlemen, and the other gentleman asks him, what is in that bag? And the guy said, it's a MacGuffin. And the other fellow says, well, what's a MacGuffin? And the guy says, it's a device for trapping lions in the Scottish Highlands. And the guy, there was a pause for a minute, and the guy says, well, but there are no lions in the, <laughs> are no lions in the Scottish Highlands. And the guy looks up at it and says, well, I guess it's not a MacGuffin. <laughs> So um, it's this kind of thing which, uh, you know, it, it's an example of something that, uh, uh, you know, is really not significant, you know. Uh, it's not real. It's not really important. So the important is the struggle between the actors, not so much the, the object itself. Okay, so let's go on now to another theme in your book about um, things are more than what they seem. The, the scenes mm -hmm. that Hitchcock shoots and the plots and the characters are multi-layered. And you gave a great example with the film Psycho. The film yeah. Psycho is perhaps most famous for this shower scene, which has been discussed endlessly. Um, yeah. Yet, I thought it was fascinating that your book brought a completely new dimension to it um, oh. that I hadn't thought of. And one of the things you talk about in the book you mentioned you quote Joseph Stefano, the scriptwriter for Psycho, who mm -hmm. says it would be much more terrible and affecting for someone to be killed after she's finally got back on the right track and washed herself clean. Yes. So, so yes. Janet Lee, the character, has decided actually to give the money back. And mm -hmm. so she's turned her life around. Um, mm -hmm. She does some calculations about how much money she spent and 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 so on um uh, intending uh, to pay them pay the money back yeah. yeah rips up some paper flushes it down the loo which is where the calculations are on mm -hmm. um gets again i don't want to spoil it but but gets horribly murdered immediately after this and what's fascinating mm -hmm. about what you're saying is it's a hell of a lot more going on in this scene just than simply someone gets killed and also the, uh, also the point about it being in the shower that the notion of cleansing she's cleansing herself of the crime mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and and despite her efforts to do that she gets murdered in the shower could, could yes. you say a bit about what you were getting at with this with this film and this scene well, I, I think that uh, at that when I discussed that particular aspect of it, I was suggesting that the, this, this was a way in which um, uh, Hitchcock's, uh, I think, religious background sort of creeps into the film because 
uh, not in a direct way, because in no way is Hitchcock a Catholic apologist or is he preaching Catholicism of any kind. It simply means that some of the basic themes that we see he deals with, this sort of uh, burden of guilt that this woman is dealing with, and her really her relief once she makes the decision to return and to make good on the, the crime that she's committed, um, that this is uh, to some extent kind of... Uh, almost uh, a religious uh, uh, experience for her. Um, uh, and uh, Stefano himself said, I think I quote Stefano as saying that it was probably some unconscious uh, drawing on our boat. We're both Catholics and we have this thing about guilt and, and expiation. And uh, so uh, I think it's a good example there of how, um, uh, how uh, some of his, uh, religious uh, concerns, at least subconscious concerns, kind of creep into the film. Uh, even though in some ways it's a rather bleak thing to have happened. I mean, this person who's obviously had a turnaround in her, in her uh, moral nature, but, you know, is killed mercilessly, you know. And this, uh, of course, raises, I think, something that he takes very seriously is that, you know, why, why do you know, the wicked prosper in the world, you know, why, why did the innocent suffer and, and the wicked prosper? And this itself is a kind of uh, religious question, I guess. Um, the, the final scene of Psycho is a famous scene where a psychiatrist explains uh, mm -hmm. the series of gruesome uh, murders. Yeah. Um, and um, what's fascinating about it, there's another book about film and psychiatry by Gabbard and Gabbard, mm -hmm. um, Psychiatry in the Cinema, where they, re they, they regard this film as extremely important because they kind of make out this is the height of um, the worship of psychoanalysis uh, by Hollywood because mm -hmm. the psychiatrist takes over the role of the detective in mm -hmm. kind of like um, unraveling the mystery. Yeah. Um, but for Gabbard and Gabbard, it's downhill all the way from this point onwards in yeah. terms of the way psychiatrists in particular are portrayed. Because this final scene is almost reverential uh -huh. uh, in the film in terms of its, its attitude to the psychiatrist. He is all-knowing, mm -hmm. all-wise. Mm -hmm. Yes, very in much a way, so. In a way that no other uh, film or, or, or um, scene ever does from that point onwards. Psychiatrists become mm -hmm. deeply flawed characters. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So Gabbard and Gabbard re re regard this scene as extremely important. Um, uh, okay. do, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, only that I think there is always a bit of reserve the way Hitchcock treats psychiatry. I think he does treat it with respect, generally speaking, and, and certainly uh, uh, you know uh, more so than, than, than subsequent films. Um, but I think there's always a sense that somehow uh, that psychiatry, like the police, sometimes misses the mark uh, of what's really going on with a character. Now, that particular scene, um, and I'm not sure I'm right about this, to be honest. I think you're quite right. It, it is a very reverential scene, I think. There's no sense of irony about the, care, about the psychiatrist, whatever. Uh, but it was a scene that that Hitchcock resisted putting in the film because this was something that Stefano, the writer of the film, insisted was an important element to explain to the audience why uh, Norman behaved the way he did. Um, personally, I find the the imagery that Hitchcock uses a little more eloquent when he then moves from that explanation of the psychiatrist to the uh, the uh, shot of his mother sitting in the cell, or I'm sorry, saw it, the shot of the uh, of, of Norman sitting in the cell, and the few little things I won't say it in detail in case somebody has to see the film, but uh, uh, that uh, the, um, the the final scene there to me adds a dimension that I think is missing in the psychiatrist's explanation, but. Um, and uh, I think I refer also to an earlier film called Vertigo, where, where again, you have a kind of, uh, I think there's a, several films actually in which the psychiatrist gives a kind of diagnosis. Uh, there's also The Wrong Man too, where a, um, uh, uh, the, the wife of the central character has a, has a breakdown. Um, but, uh, you know, it's almost as if he's sort of saying, well, look, we get a certain kind of truth in what the psychiatrist is saying, but 
the dramatic truth also carries a message that that really can't be captured so much in a diagnosis. But you know, that's just my personal opinion. I could be wrong about that. Now, the other thing that's interesting um, is um, one of the things that Hitchcock relies on is looks, glances. Yes. And you go into this in great detail, fascinating detail. And again, it reminds mm -hmm. us that today modern filmmakers rely a lot on special effects and, yes. and stuff. And Hitchcock relied on much simpler things, like the way someone looked at someone, and yet it was somehow more powerful. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lovely um, analysis of the different looks that are going on in the film Psycho. So um, Janet Lee gets pulled over by a policeman, yes. um, and um, he and and now that you mention it, because I I always thought this was a strange scene, the way it's shot, mm -hmm. yes, um, yes. and now it became clearer to me what's going on from your analysis. There's mm -hmm. something very foreboding and threatening about the stare of the policeman. Mm -hmm. Janet mm -hmm. Lee looks, I think, for a driving license and has to cover up the money that's in the handbag. <laughs> Um, and then there is another key moment of the stare when um, Norman Bates is looking voyeuristically through a, a, a hole at yes. Janet yes. Lee when she checks into his motel. And then there's a lovely analysis you give in the book, which I, again, I've always wondered why it was there. But um, when uh, Norman Bates is disposing of the body in the car, it's going into mm -hmm. the marsh. The, the the car sinks into the marsh then seems to stop sinking yes and yes. and norman bates frowns <laughs> because he, yeah. and then the car disappears into the marsh and he grins yes. and that kind of subtle facial expression yes. Yes. so much is going on there could you yeah. say a bit about that um okay there's kind of two things there about the looks and the the uh, facial expressions but uh i i've always found uh hitchcock's the way he captures looks and ex exchanged looks between people really disturbing. I think that that example of the policeman examining um, uh, uh, Janet Lee in, in the in the in the car in Psycho is a good example of what you know those disturbing elements in Hitchcock that sort of remain with you. It's a kind of image you don't forget very easily. Um, now, for me, the look is rife with potential violence, especially from a policeman. I, I think uh, one of the things that occurred to me when you were speaking is, uh, is uh, Hitchcock's well-known fear of police. And this is often joked about, and he joked about it himself. But to me, it carries a real kind of message that uh, policemen aren't necessarily bad people. And, and that's not what I'm saying. Uh, but they do carry, they're the one you know, sort of profession in society that is legit is kind of uh, allowed to exert violence officially. You know? And uh, Hitchcock was just terrified of the police, uh, mainly because he had an experience as a child, which uh, kind of exacerbated it. But um, the look, to some extent, uh, to me, is invested with emotion in in Hitchcock, and not obvious emotion. I mean, there's a lot of you know, kind of emotional fireworks you'll see in a scene, but somehow it just doesn't, it falls flat. It, you know, it's, you know, so what? Uh, but he's able to inject a certain kind of power in a look uh, when it's uh, framed in a certain way and when he places it within a certain situation. Um, now, facial expressions too, I think, are extremely expressive. And, and again, this shows uh, Hitchcock's careful design. Uh, his actors often said that he would give instructions down to, you know, make sure your eye is open like this when you look over here, place your head in that position. He was very, very controlling, as people uh, uh, said. Um, but boy, what does he accomplish with it on, on film? You, you remember that little smile that uh, Janet Lee has when she's fleeing, having stolen the money, thinking about the guy that she ripped off, you know? <laughs> And she gets this little grin, very much like the grin that uh, Norman has when he uh, disposes of some of his victims. So, and, uh, you know, again, it's this fantasy of p control and power which comes with violence uh, and violent action that is nearly irresistible for people. And it's also very disturbing because it means it's a lot closer to us than it would. It's not just something that uh, you know, uh, you know, fantastic villains like you see in these comic book uh, movies, you know, there's this sort of extravagant kind of evil character 
But ordinary people like this woman working in an office who's capable of kind of a sadistic uh, pleasure in, in, in stealing some money, you know, uh, and, uh, and what genius to make Norman, who in the, the novel, the film is based upon, to, to make him a rather vulnerable, gentle, even likable character uh, with these dark potential uh, violent actions. Um, you know, instead of in the novel, he was this kind of elderly, drunken and overweight man who committed these crimes, something you would expect of someone like that. Uh, Hitchcock's just very good at kind of selecting the expression or whatever to carry uh, a message uh, about the character. But I also thought that one of the things you were saying is that the stare becomes central to what films are about, because after all, the audience is staring at the screen. Yes. The sense in which the gaze is extremely yes. important. And yeah. what Hitchcock mm -hmm. is telling us is that you're staring at something, you're looking very closely at something. Well, mm -hmm. at the heart of film is the look, the stare. Yes, yes. Yes, and obviously the human face is so central to film. It isn't always. I mean, some people, you know, de-emphasize, some directors de-emphasize that. But, um, yes, the stare is essential for the transfer of emotion, basically. The transfer of it shows love, violence, uh, cruelty. Uh, there's obvious kind of flexibility of expression. But to, to me, it's essential to, to the mimetic process because... Again, a, a, a crowd who victimizes an individual, uh, you know, you know, one of the great things that Hitchcock cinema does is shows what it is to be an individual faced with <laughs> cruelty from from violent, uh, uh, violent aggressors, you know, and uh, it's all communicated through the eyes, really. And that leads us on nicely to another idea that you discuss in the book, the notion of victims and the perspective mm. of the victim. And you yes. talk a bit about how you believe there's a key moment in history, um, or you're quoting people who believe this, um, whereby the central story of the victim, the perspective of the victim, begin, begins to become dominant. And there is a yeah. sense in which that's what Hitchcock films are about. And because we all feel like we're victims, um, yeah. that's part of the nature of the deep psychological appeal. Of his mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I was always impressed when I heard a, an interview with him and he said his principal concern was the innocent victim in his films. And this is what uh, he, he felt was, uh, was, was, was one of his central themes. Um, and the person who made the claim about the centrality of the victim uh, the awareness of the victim was, was René Girard and his claim was that uh, in the event of the crucifixion, which is, of course, the central event in Christianity that uh, one uh, experiences. And, of course, the crucifixion basically is prefaced by a story about uh, the victimization of, a, of, a, of an innocent man by a crowd, essentially. Um, in fact, it's a, uh, one of the first um, exposés, shall we say, of the mimetic frenzy of the crowd shall we say, who demands a victim in order to um, uh, satisfy uh, um, its uh, imagined fears or whatever the case may be. Um, so Gerard's claim was that there's a p particular place that's, that the idea of the victim is, uh, takes in, in Christianity. It's uh, obviously, again, he doesn't deny that... Uh, Sympathy for the victim sometimes doesn't extend to non-Christian people. Sometimes, when uh, the based on the way the church has behaved over the centuries, but in its purity, anyway, the crucifixion story is about an individual who has been victimized by a crowd, and theoretically, this is the foundation of the Christian understanding of neighbor love, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so his claim was that the, that our concern for the victim now, and of course there's now a, a kind of a secularized version of this concern for the victim, and, and there's uh, multiple, even in this the, the, the latest Me Too movement, for example, there's a tremendous outpouring of sympathy for people who've been assaulted in various ways, and for all for the good. But it comes from a kind of principle that we acknowledge that the innocent victim should be 
acknowledged and that the suffering of the innocent victim is, is important. It's a human right to be free from violence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is a kind of secularized version, I think, of that kind of religious event, or at least according to, to Gerard's interpretation. So it's become a kind of uh, um, central concern for our culture, and it's something that you find very strongly, I think, in Hitchcock's work. He tends to he, he does wonderful things with this camera, taking the point of view of the victim, actually. And again, the, the birds is a very good example of this, somebody being attacked by birds, exactly. Um, and uh, the camera is just this wonderful medium by which you can uh, adopt the position of somebody who is under attack. Uh, and this happens all the way through from the wrong man, which is about somebody wrongly accused, and uh, the birds, which has innocent victim of the attacks of the birds. Let's talk a bit about the birds, because now that you've mentioned, I didn't realize this, that Hitchcock himself didn't want that final explanatory scene in Psycho, he's going to leave it much more enigmatic. In a yeah. way, he's done that with the birds, because what yeah. is um, gripping but also puzzling about this film, and again, I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but basically it's never really explained why the birds start to attack. And no. that's left really hanging there. But that adds somehow to the power of this film. So now I can see that, that actually Psycho, Hitchcock wanted to make a film a bit more like Birds with Psycho. He wanted to leave that final scene out because that final scene of explanation is definitely left out in the birds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I actually think uh, Birds, I would say, is, is a more fully realized film than Psycho. I, I think there are parts of Psycho I just love. I think it's a brilliant film, but... I, I think The Birds, to me, is perfect from beginning to end. Um, I was once asked by someone who was quite, uh, didn't like the film that much, and they said, well, he really just didn't know what to do at the end. Uh, uh, and he just uh, kind of left it with this you know, unexplained ending. But I tried to argue, well, this was precisely the point. We don't know why the birds attack. It doesn't make, make any sense. The attacks are arbitrary and they are sudden, they come out of the blue, but that's exactly what human violence is like. Uh, you don't necessarily have an explanation for it, you know? So to me, the ending was, was, was actually quite uh, uh, eloquent in a way, because it left you with this uneasy feeling that attacks could continue, but you don't quite know yet, you know? So. Now, the other thing that I think is very interesting, um, and, and again, we can talk for a long time about the birds, we're running out of time a little bit, but um, the central character who is this aristocratic heiress, spoilt um, yes. but attractive uh, young mm -hmm. woman, um, goes to this very remote place, Bodega Bay, because she's pursuing um, the, the, this attractive man. Um, the birds start to attack. Um, she um, takes refuge in a um, cafe where mm -hmm. the townspeople are taking refuge and they yes. turn on her. Yes. They blame her for the attack yeah. of the birds. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and now this, this scene makes a lot more sense. Where now you've got into the notion of the scapegoat being mm -hmm. a very important part of mm -hmm. uh, what um, Hitchcock's films are about. Could you say something about that? Well, the scapegoat, I think, is a, a kind of... Uh safety valve in a way for a situation in which uh, people are panicking. And if you find somebody who you think is at the root of the problem, of course, this happens in, you know, in medieval times when uh, witches were blamed, say, for the failure of a crop or the death of a child. And uh, this causes enormous social unrest. And until they find the person who caused this death or caused this famine, everything is under threat of falling apart. Uh, but when you find the reason for the problem, uh, whether it's a witch or also uh, Jews were blamed on occasion for wells being poisoned or, or, or the fact that they did fairly well during the plague, according to some people, um, you know, there is this instinct to transfer your fear and the violence it inspires to someone else. So in a sense, the scapegoat is this channel for our fears, our hatreds, whatever the case may be. Um, 
the uh, the current immigration crisis, for example, is arising is a, is is arousing all sorts of uh, kind of uh, feelings of this nature. In a sense, you 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 need a kind of scapegoat to to free yourself from this feeling of distress. You know, whether you're uh, under threat of, uh, of of poverty or or death or or or, or chaos, um, and in this particular scene, of course the town has just been torn apart by a vicious attack by numerous birds and uh, um, Melanie herself is trapped outside briefly before the scene you're mentioning in a phone booth and this is one of uh, Hitchcock's uh, famous set pieces where you see the birds dive bombing on Melanie and practically breaking through the glass and she's saved at the last minute by her uh, love interest Mitch brought into the diner and then to confront what should be the sympathy of her, the community, because she's nearly been, you know, destroyed by these birds. Instead, she's confronted by one lady who comments on the fact that uh, the whole attacks, all of these attacks started when she arrived in town. It must have something to do with you. You're evil, evil. And uh, finally, she's stopped with a slap by uh, by Melanie. Um, the way this scene is shot is often, I think, gone over a bit too quickly because you'll notice that around this woman is is gathered the whole of the community, in a sense, or, or a kind of represent as if they represent the entire community, um, looking at her with the same sense of hostility. Um, I find it remark. I don't find any any other film director who comments on this kind of impulse in people. And again, it's part of the claim, I think, that violence um, does erupt in people and we tend to pass it on instead of, and in a way, it's hard to not think of those women and the woman who accuses Melanie as mimicking the birds around them. In fact, they're adopting this (laughs) kind of, uh, you know, uh, irrational, arbitrary violence. It has but they no also place. flock. They kind of flock together. Exactly, yeah. Mm. In fact, they're in a flock in, in the cafe, right? Mm. And mm. Uh, so there's, I don't think, I couldn't find anyone who commented on this, that, uh, that there was a kind of parallel between mm. the attack on Melanie outside and and it's because we're so focused on the Freudian interpretation, which is <laughs> the... the, the uh, some of the Freudian uh, readers of this film, uh, critics of this film, have argued that this outburst of attack by the birds is really an, uh, an expression of the mother's death drive, her jealousy of Melanie, right? Mm. Uh, which is plausible because there is hostility shown by the mother to Melanie when she arrives. There are attacks that, of the birds that take place uh, when Melanie arrives uh, and is confronted by the mother. So this is all part of the the general approach to the film, which I think is correct. That the 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 birds does the attacks of the birds really reflect the human conflicts, not so much a revenge of nature or something like that. But I want to just focus on this this scene that you've been discussing, which is that I think part of the genius of Hitchcock is that the audience is left guessing as to why the birds are attacking. And yes, you're puzzled yes. and you're trying to work it out. And actually, when mm. the crowd in the cafe turn on the central heroine character, who you have been kind of rooting for throughout, mm-hmm. you yeah. you wonder whether actually she's at fault. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's what's very powerful about Hitchcock. He really... Yes. Um, messes with you yeah, in, in a yeah. very profound way. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I think sometimes he can tempt the, um, uh, the, 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 the audience, the viewer, to blame the same character in the same way. Um, there's, uh, I think, numerous instances in, in, in Hitchcock where he kind of... Uh, puts the the audience in that position where they falsely blame someone for the crime or in fact it turns out it's someone else you know it's because you want that character to be the one or something like that or he's betrayed he or she's betrayed in such a way as to make them seem criminal when in fact they are not a good example of this is one of his very first films the, the first uh, truly hitchcockian film which is called the lodger a story based on uh, the um 
the the story of the Jack the Ripper are loosely based on it. And uh, there's a character there who, uh, you know, you begin to believe has to be the killer, <laughs> but uh, it turns out much differently uh, as the proceedings continue. And of course, also the characters in the film suspect him as well, you know. So, so yeah, you're right. I think there is a sense in which uh, uh, Hitchcock continually plays with the audience uh, to uh, arouse suspense and uh, also perhaps a bit of guilt. <laughs> so it's been fascinating talking to you, uh, David. I'm going to repeat the title of the book in a second, but just one final question, which is probably going to make you want to run screaming from the room. Uh -oh. But um, we've been praising Hitchcock. Is there a modern director or is there a director since Hitchcock that you would put on the same level of creating movies that could bear the kind of in-depth analysis uh, which films like Psycho, Vertigo, The Birds, Marnie, and so on can endure? <coughs> or, or is it really the case that no one has come close since Hitchcock in yeah. this kind of work? Um. I, I think people come close, but in a different kind of way. I don't think they're different kind of directors. Like uh, so, someone like Stanley Kubrick, I think, is someone who ranks right up there with with uh, Hitchcock. I think his uh, films stand analysis, multiple viewings, and so on and so forth. Uh, a very different kind of director, not so much a, a director of suspense, but um, I think uh, also the films of Terrence Malick, to some extent, uh, have that kind of quality. But again, very different kind of director, not a popular director as, as Hitchcock. I, I think Hitchcock's really kind of unique because his work is so popular and yet is so finely done. You know, it's very rare to get that kind of combination. Well, thank you very much, David Hubbard. It's been a joy talking to you. Just to repeat the title of the book, Violence in the Films of Alfred Hitchcock, A Study in Mimesis, uh, written by David Humbert, published by Michigan State University Press. David, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. It's been, been a pleasure.